Hello, I'm Stephen Wilkins from the University of Sussex. Welcome to the first of our new series of lectures from the Sussex Universe Lecture Series. Today I'm going to be talking about the Hubble Space Telescope, celebrating 30 years. But a little bit about myself first. Well, I was born in Leeds in Yorkshire. I was then an undergraduate student at the University of Durham, after which I went to the University of Cambridge to do my PhD. I then spent three and a half years at the University of Oxford as a researcher. Then, around seven years ago, I was made a lecturer, then senior lecturer, and now reader in astronomy at the University of Sussex. Today, I'm also director of Outreach and Public Engagement and an STFC Public Engagement Fellow. Now, today I'm going to be talking about the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched into low Earth orbit almost 30 years ago in 1990. Over its lifetime, it's enabled numerous discoveries that have changed our view of the entire universe. Despite its age, it actually remains one of the most advanced and in-demand observatories. So today I'm going to talk about four things. <clears throat> First of all, the history of Hubble, Hubble today, some of the science that's been done with Hubble, and then looking forward to the future of Hubble. So Hubble's history. Well, the idea of a space observatory was first proposed by the American astronomer Lyman Spitzer shortly after the Second World War. Spitzer explained that a space observatory could overcome some of the adverse effects of the Earth's atmosphere. In particular, this would enable observations at wavelengths which are normally absorbed, such as the X-rays, ultraviolet and infrared light. What you can see here is the atmospheric opacity, basically what fraction of light makes it through the atmosphere, as a function of wavelength. So over here in the X-rays and the UV, the atmosphere blocks all of the light, whereas in the visible and the radio, our atmosphere is actually transparent and allows us to do astronomy from the ground. The infrared is a little bit mixed in that some can make it through, but most of it actually can't, hence why we still have infrared space telescopes as well. Now with the advent of spaceflight in the late 1950s, this idea was soon realised. The very first obser space observatory was actually the US's Orbiting Solar Observatory Programme, as well as the UK's Aerial Programme, which both launched in 1962. Both programs observed the sun and eventually other objects at wavelengths which were inaccessible from the ground, for example the X-rays and the UV. Here's just an image of a model of Aerial 1, which now hangs in the, in the Science Museum in London. Now the Orbiting Solar Observatory program was followed beginning in 1966 by the US-led Orbiting Astronomical Observatory program, or OAO program. This actually consisted of four satellites, of which two were successful. And here we can see an artist's impression of one of these satellites in orbit, starting to look very similar to what Hubble looks like today. The very final one of these missions, OAO-3, was launched in late 1972 and proved to be the most successful of all. It was actually an early collaboration between NASA and the UK's Science Research Council, which is today called the Science and Technologies Facilities Council. And again, you can see a real image of OAO-3 here now, showing how much it really does look like Hubble today. So we see the kind of familiar baffle of the telescope and its solar panels. Now the OAO program focused on observing wavelengths of light which are, rel which are heavily blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. But there are also good reasons for a visible or optical space observatory despite the fact that our atmosphere is mostly transparent. So while most visible light is able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere, it's distorted and spread out. This makes it very difficult to resolve small features and observe very faint objects. And this is actually a really big concern for very large telescopes, which were being developed in the 50s, 60s and 70s. So what we can see here are two images, one of the moon and one of a star. And what we're seeing is a series of images taken at different times of the same objects, showing the effects of the atmosphere now. So on the moon, you can see what the atmosphere is doing from frame to frame is that it's distorting what the actual moon looks like. And the same with the star. But with the star, we can also see that it's spreading out the light of the star, whereas it should really appear as a point source. Now, the success of the OAO program and the growing need to overcome some of the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere led to the development of what was then called the Large Space Telescope, or LST. The original plan for LST was a 3 meter diameter telescope with a launch date of the late 1970s. To extend its lifetime, LST was designed to be maintained by crewed missions to the telescope via the reusable space shuttle program, which was concurrently under development. Now, unfortunately, LST failed to generate sufficient political support, and in the mid-1970s, the project was almost entirely abandoned due to public spending cuts. However, through a lobbying effort by astronomers, support grew, and funds were eventually made available, 
albeit for a smaller 2.4 metre mission with a launch date of now 1983. These funding issues also prompted collaboration with the European Space Agency, who agreed to provide one of the first generation instruments as well as the solar cells. In fact, this first generation instrument we can see here, this is a picture of the faint object camera, Europe's, one of Europe's contributions being removed in 2002 to make way for the advanced camera for surveys. At this point, the telescope was also renamed in honour of the Hubble in order of Edwin Hubble, an American astronomer who was active in the 1920s to 40s. So we can see the design here. So what we see here is the very familiar design of light going into the telescope from the upper left hand corner. It then travels down the telescope where it's reflected by a large primary mirror about halfway along. So it's reflected back up the telescope. But then around halfway up again, it's reflected back down by a secondary mirror. Now the light then travels down towards the bottom half of the telescope which contains the instrumentation including cameras and spectrographs. We can also see here the solar panels which provide power as well as the communications antennae as well. Now Hubble was developed and built in the early 1980s and by January 1986 a planned launch that year was actually feasible. Unfortunately, in late January, the Space Shuttle Challenger broke apart shortly after launch, with the entire crew being lost. As the Space Shuttle was integral to Hubble's launch, Challenger's loss placed the mission in serious jeopardy. But, shuttle flights eventually did resume in 1988, and Hubble was launched in the Space Shuttle Discovery on the 24th of April 1990, almost 30 years ago today. Hubble was then deployed the following day. So we can see here that this is Hubble being deployed from the Space Shuttle for the first time. But Hubble's problems didn't end there. Soon after the launch it was realised that it was a serious problem. Hubble's image quality was much worse than expected, potentially compromising much of the planned scientific analysis. What you can see here is one of the images taken from Hubble early on in the mission. Now this is much blurrier than expected and in fact is not much better than images from the ground. It was realised that this problem was down to the mirror. It turns out the mirror had been ground to the wrong shape. The reason for this is actually the device that was supposed to tell the engineers that the mirror was the right shape had been incorrectly assembled itself. This is like trying to measure something, measure the length of something using a ruler where the marks on the ruler are not in the right place. And it led to real serious problems and potentially compromised a lot of the science. However, as I mentioned earlier, Hubble was always designed to be serviceable, and in 1993, Servicing Mission 1 installed a new system, CoStar, designed to correct this problem. Unfortunately, this did require sacrificing one of the science instruments, though. So what we can see now is this image before Servicing Mission 1 on the left, and then after Servicing Mission 1 on the right. This shows the dramatic improvement that these adaptations have made to Hubble, allowing it to see much fainter and more detail. Up until 2002, Hubble was actually serviced a further three times. During these missions, broken parts were replaced and new instruments were installed. But crucially, the telescope was also boosted up to a higher orbit. This is because, over time, Hubble's orbit slowly decays towards the Earth due to drag on the Earth's atmosphere. Now, These servicing missions maintained Hubble as a state-of-the-art observatory. Hubble was due to be serviced for a fifth time in 2005. However, the 2003 Columbia disaster caused future manned missions to Hubble to be cancelled. Now, spatial missions themselves were not fully cancelled. However, there was a requirement that, in the case of an emergency, the astronauts should be able to reach the safety of the International Space Station. Unfortunately, this was not possible from Hubble. And so at this point, Hubble's future seemed fairly certain that eventually something would break in the next few years and it would cease operation. However, in due part to leadership changes at NASA, but also political and public support, as well as the support from astronauts themselves. This decision was ultimately reversed, and a final servicing mission, called Servicing Mission 4, was scheduled to take place in 2009. This mission involved critical repairs and the installation of two new instruments. These included Wifield Camera 3, which became Hubble's most versatile and advanced camera. This is now just showing Hubble being attached to the space shuttle for the final time. And then this, this is one of my favourite pictures from the whole Hubble servicing missions. What we can see here is an astronaut having their picture taken by one of their colleagues. Okay, 
but in their visor we can see their colleague actually taking the picture. But behind their colleague we can see both the Hubble Space Telescope and the Earth. I think it just makes a really nice image. Along these lines, this is one of the final close-ups that we had of Hubble shortly after it was released. So, let's talk about Hubble today. Despite being surpassed in size by ground-based telescopes, including things like the Very Large Telescope in Chile, Hubble's vantage point above the atmosphere means that it, remain, means that it remains one of the world's premier and most in-demand observatories. Today, Hubble has four instruments, Wide Field Camera 3, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, and the Advanced Camera Surveys, and the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. These instruments provide spectroscopy and imaging across the visible spectrum alongside much of the ultraviolet and a little bit of the infrared. So since Hubble's beginnings, these servicing missions have not only maintained the observatory but have expanded its capabilities. And this leads me on to the science of Hubble. So Hubble's ability to probe across the UV, visible and near infrared, and its position above the blurring atmosphere, make it suited to tackle a whole range of science. And in fact, Hubble has never been used just for one type of science. Today, Hubble is used to find and study the most distant objects in the universe, but also study our very own solar system. This here is one of my favourite images from Hubble. This is the Pillars of Creation. This is a star-forming region in our own galaxy. So in these clouds of gas, new stars and planets and potentially even life is being formed. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about that Hubble has done include the age of the universe, the accelerated expansion, how Hubble has been used to explore the solar system, the deep fields, my own focus of work, and also distant worlds. So first of all, the age of the universe. We've known since the 1920s and 30s that our universe is expanding, and that it's only been around a finite amount of time. Before Hubble the telescope, scientists predicted that the age of the universe ranged from between 10 to 20 billion years. This is quite a large range. But thanks in part to Hubble, the estimated age of the universe today is 13.8 billion years, with an uncertainty of only a few hundred million years. Okay, so this is what Hubble did very early in its lifetime, it actually allowed us to measure the age of the universe much more precisely than ever before. Hubble is also really useful for finding these supernova explosions. These are what happen towards the end of the lives of some stars. And they are often very, very bright, and thus they can be seen very, very far away. So what you can see here is a supernova in a relatively nearby galaxy. So this galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars. But despite that, this single star exploding is almost of comparable brightness. Supernovae are really important, partly because they're actually the source of many of the heavy elements that we have today. So things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, they're all created or dispersed in these supernova explosions. So what you see here are the leftover remains of a star which has exploded. Okay? In this material, this material is enriched with heavy elements. And this material will ultimately go on to make a new generation of stars and potentially planets, and thus potentially life. Now, the observations of these distant supernovae revealed that the expansion of the universe was not behaving the way it should. The force of gravity should be making the expansion of the universe slow down, so gravity should be pulling things together. However, what we found by looking at these supernovae was that the actual opposite was true. The expansion appears to be accelerating. Now this discovery was subsequently confirmed by several other experiments. The work of the original supernova teams was ultimately rewarded with the award of the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2011. Now today we attribute this accelerated expansion to the presence of something called dark energy. This is really a term of ignorance though, because exactly what dark energy is remains unclear. This is actually the focus of lots of intensive study throughout astronomy and the physics communities. Hubble has also been used to study objects in our own solar system. While we've got robotic probes which are now able to study the solar system in much more detail than Hubble, by virtue of being able to get closer to objects, there are still some cases where Hubble has made significant impact. One of these is that Hubble can study wavelengths of light that robotic probes often can't. So what you're seeing here is an image of Hubble in the UV. Sorry, an image of Saturn in the UV taken by Hubble. And what we can see is there are these bright spots around the poles. These are actually aurorae. Okay, so this is caused by the interaction of the magnetic field of Saturn with charged particles coming off the Sun. And these cause bits of the atmosphere to glow like this. 
Now we see this phenomenon on the Earth often as the northern and southern lights, something like this. But with Hubble, we've been able to observe it on other planets. And not just Saturn, we've also seen this on Jupiter. Okay, Because Jupiter is a bit larger and a bit closer, we can see it in even more detail than on Hubble, than on Saturn. Sorry. Now Hubble can also observe objects that we've not yet visited by robotic probes. So for example, this shows the former planet Pluto and three of its moons. Now I know that, Hub that Pluto has actually been observed by a robotic probe now, but not when this picture was taken. I think more crucially though, Hubble is actually able to observe objects at any time, whereas space probes may only be at a particular planet for a short period of time. There might be large gaps of many decades between visits to a particular planet, whereas Hubble can actually observe planets all the time and therefore observe transitory or rare events. Perhaps one of the most impressive of these was Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. This was a comet that was discovered in 1993 orbiting Jupiter. By the time of its discovery, it had been broken apart by Jupiter's gravity into all these little pieces, and it was predicted to collide with the planet in 1994. And that's exactly what it did. In the middle of 1994, it impacted Jupiter. Hubble and other telescopes were able to observe these impacts and see the huge visible marks left on the planet's surface. So here we have the disk of Jupiter, and what you can see are the visible marks caused by the fragments of the comet actually hitting the planet's atmosphere. So some of these marks are around the same size as the Earth. Now Hubble was so much more capable than its predecessors and ground-based telescopes that actually some of the most significant discoveries were things that we hadn't yet anticipated. The way that we can actually make some of these discoveries is by observing blank areas of the sky. In 1995, Hubble embarked on its very first deep field. This was the eponymous Hubble Deep Field. The field chosen was a relatively empty patch of sky believed to contain only a few stars or galaxies. By observing, observing the same field for many hours or even days, very faint objects could be detected. The result was the discovery of thousands of galaxies stretching back over much of the universe's history. So this here is the Hubble Deep Field. And most of those sources of light are individual galaxies containing billions of stars. Right? These stretch back over the history of the universe because light takes some finite amount of time to reach us. This experiment has been repeated several times over the years, notably with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in 2004, okay, with additions in 2009, 2012, and most recently the Frontier Fields project. Each iteration has pushed deeper and further back in time. Here's an example of the very final image. This is our most sensitive view of the universe, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field. This contains thousands of galaxies extending over around 90% of the universe's history. So it's kind of like a slice of our entire universe's history. We can just pick on one of these little galaxies here, this faint red thing. This is actually a galaxy that we're seeing when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. More recently, Hubble has actually been turned to identify and studying planets around other stars, so-called exoplanets. Hubble is not really designed to find large numbers of exoplanets, however its unique capabilities have sometimes been used to actually directly image planets around other stars. So what we can see here is the star Fermilot. Okay? The star would actually be in the centre of the image where it appears quite black, but the actual light from the star has been blocked out. By doing this, you're able to see some of the fainter objects around the star. What we can see here is two things. First of all, we can see this bright ring. This bright ring is lots of small material, perhaps dust or asteroids, surrounding the planet. But if we look very closely on the bottom right hand corner, we can also see this one object which appears to move in different years. By looking at this and actually watching this small object move over time, we can infer that this is a planet. But I think more exciting, though, is Hubble's ability to actually characterise the atmospheres of exoplanets. We can do this by taking advantage of this effect. When a planet passes between its parent star and the Earth, some of the star's light is blocked, basically an eclipse. However, some of that light has got to travel through that planet's atmosphere. As it does this, that atmosphere imprints the signature of its composition onto that light. And even though this only makes up a tiny fraction of the light that we receive from the star during an eclipse, it's enough that we can actually measure the composition of that planet's atmosphere. In 2019, Hubble actually confirmed the presence of water in the atmosphere of a planet for the first time. 
Now this planet is relatively small and actually lies in the habitable zone of its parent star, which means potentially humans could one day stand on there and breathe unaided. Let's talk about the future though. The retirement of the Space Shuttle program means that Hubble can no longer be serviced. Ultimately its instruments will break and it will no longer be able to maintain its orbit. Exactly when this will happen is unclear. It could be tomorrow or it could be in a decade. So if we look at some of the present observatories, we have Hubble here, the Very Large Telescope, the Vista Telescope, Spitzer and Herschel. We see that Hubble is relatively small compared to the VLT and other telescopes. Okay. In between Hubble and today, we have actually have had a whole series of space telescopes, including Spitzer, okay, which actually only turned off a few months ago, and then the Hersch Herschel Space Telescope in 2009 to 2011. Herschel is very close to our hearts here in Sussex because we were involved in the project right from the very beginning. Herschel actually only lived a small amount of time because as an infrared telescope, it has to be cooled, which meant it had a con needed a continuous source of liquid helium to cool it. Now coming soon is the Webb telescope. Okay, as we can see here, Webb is comparable in size to the VLT, much larger than Hubble, and this is due to be launched in hopefully a year's time. So this is the James Webb Space Telescope to give it its full name. Unlike Hubble, it looks quite different. So we can see gone is the familiar shape of a telescope. And what we see now is the primary and secondary mirror exposed with this big sun shield on the bottom. Now, like Hubble, Webb is an international mission built by NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Research institutes and universities across the UK, Europe and the US all contributed towards its development. But more crucially, thousands of astronomers across the world will be able to use Webb to answer a whole range of scientific questions. So Webb has a mirror which is around five times larger than Hubble's. But unlike Hubble, Webb is designed to operate almost solely in the infrared. So what we see here is the range of wavelengths that Webb will observe compared to Hubble. So whereas Hubble observed the UV, the visible and a little bit of the infrared, Webb is really designed to observe most of the infrared. The need to operate in the infrared actually influences, influences many aspects of its design, but in particular the mirror material, which is now coated in gold instead of aluminium, and the thermal properties of the entire telescope, which means that Webb is no longer going to be in orbit around the Earth, but actually in orbit around the Sun, much further away. This actually allows Webb to see further back in time, see through dust, but also measure the composition of alien atmospheres. Now, despite many delays, Webb was on track to launch next year until the recent circumstances, so I now have to change this to maybe. But like Hubble, it will likely revolutionise our view of the entire universe. This is what Webb looked like a few months ago now. But Webb isn't really a direct successor to Hubble, so Webb is more of an infrared telescope, whereas Hubble is a UV visible and a little bit of the infrared telescope. And so, if we really want a direct successor to Hubble, we need to look much further into the future. In fact, we need to look towards a proposal called the Large Ultraviolet Optical and Infrared Surveyor. This is a concept which is being studied by NASA and the European Space Agency. So Louvois looks like this. Again, it looks a little bit like a much larger version of Webb, which pretty much is exactly what it is. So we can see what Louvois looks like here compared to Webb. So this actually brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Hubble was launched almost 30 years ago today. Since the launch, Hubble has been serviced five times, allowing it to maintain its position as one of the most productive and advanced observatories. Hubble has been used to explore from our own solar system all the way to the edge of the observable universe. Hubble will soon be succeeded by the Webb Telescope, due for launch in 2021, but perhaps delayed a little bit due to the current crisis. And then in the longer term, we may see Louvois following in the late 2030s or early 2040s. Thank you for listening in everybody. Do remember to watch some of the other lectures on the Sussex Universe channel. And do remember if you're watching this live that you can catch me for a live question and answer on Zoom from around 7.30. The link for Zoom is in the description.